Welcome to my series on practical transfusion medicine. I am Kathleen Wong and I'm a hematopathologist at the University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. This is part two on blood product utilization and clinical indications. By the end of this session, you'll be able to achieve the following objectives. Number one, order red cells, platelets, and plasma for the appropriate clinical indications. Number two, have basic understanding of the types of fractionated products available in the blood bank. Number three, demonstrate basic understanding of the general clinical indications for intravenous immune globulin or IVIG. And number four, order a prothrombin complex concentrate or PCC for emergency warfarin reversal. Here is a general list of the cellular products and fractionated products that you may find in your local blood bank or hospital transfusion medicine service. Please be aware that there may be some regional variability depending on local clinical needs and inventory, so you should always refer to your local transfusion medicine service for the full inventory list and their availability. The cellular blood products are red cells, platelets, plasma, and crown precipitate. These are often derived from individual whole blood collections, but platelets and plasma may also be derived from single donor apheresis collections. The fractionated blood products are derived from plasma collections from thousands of donors that undergo additional processing steps. There are three categories of fractionated products, the coagulation factors, the immune globulins, and others. The coagulation factors highlighted in green on this slide are the recombinant factors, while FIBA, PCC, and HUMAP are plasma-derived, for example. For the immune globulins, there is intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG, and other more specific types of immune globulin, including RHD immunoglobulin, known as RIG, CMV immunoglobulin, and hepatitis B immunoglobulin, etc. The last category of fractionated blood products would include plasma proteins, such as albumin. Now let's look at the cellular blood products, beginning with the red cells. In general, if the patient's hemoglobin level is greater than 100 grams per liter, then the patient is unlikely to benefit from red cell transfusion. If the hemoglobin is between 70 to 100, then it is generally okay not to transfuse the patient, but red cell transfusion may be appropriate if there is tissue hypoxia or an increased risk of impaired oxygen delivery to the tissues, for example, in unstable coronary syndromes or uncontrolled bleeding. If the hemoglobin is less than 70, the red cell transfusion is likely appropriate, but non-transfusion alternatives including hematinics should be given if deficiency is demonstrated and previously untreated. Finally, if hemoglobin is less than 60, the red cell transfusion is more likely to be generally recommended, keeping in mind that non-transfusion alternatives including hematinics should still be considered in the absence of hemodynamic instability in a deficient patient. Choosing Wisely Canada recommendations from the Canadian Society for Transfusion Medicine advise that we should not be transfusing blood if other non-transfusion therapies or observation would be just as effective. This means that in an iron deficient patient without hemodynamic instability, they should be given iron therapy instead. Why use two when one will do? Do not transfuse more than one red cell unit at a time when transfusion is required in a stable, non-bleeding patient. And finally, do not transfuse O-negative blood except to O-negative patients and in emergencies for female patients of childbearing potential of unknown blood group. Now let's take a look at the platelets and their general clinical indications. There is general agreement that prophylactic platelet transfusion is not indicated unless the platelet count is below 10 times 10 to the 9th power per liter in non-immune thrombocytopenia patients. If such a patient is HLA alloimmunized after a platelet refractoriness workup, then a unit of HLA-selected apheresis platelet may be provided prophylactically. In general, currently a single unit of pooled platelets may be transfused just prior to or during an invasive procedure if the baseline platelet count is less than 50. This would include lumbar punctures and other surgical procedures associated with more than 500 cc's of blood loss. In the setting of intracranial hemorrhage or neurosurgery, however, if the baseline platelet count is less than 100, then one pooled platelet may be provided just prior to or during the procedure. Between a platelet count of 10 to 50, platelet transfusion is not recommended for procedures not associated with significant blood loss unless the patient develops bleeding complications. In the setting of immune thrombocytopenia, 
do not transfuse platelets unless the patient develops bleeding complications. And finally, in the setting of platelet dysfunction with bleeding, for example, on antiplatelet agents or during ECMO and cardiopulmonary bypass, a unit of pool platelets may be transfused. To summarize, the standard dose of platelets for adults is one unit. The platelet count should rise by about 15 to 25 when a one-hour post-transfusion platelet count is measured. Due to inventory limitations, the Transfusion Medicine Service will never release a double dose of platelets without prior discussion and approval by the Transfusion Medicine Physician. This slide summarizes the Choosing Wisely Canada guidelines from CSTM for platelets. Their fourth recommendation is that we do not transfuse platelets for patients with chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia if the platelet count is greater than 10 times 10 to the 9 power per liter in the absence of bleeding. Please also refer to the recently published AABB Clinical Practice Guideline for Platelet Transfusion and the International Collaboration for Transfusion Medicine Group ICTMG Platelet Transfusion Guidelines for Patients with Hypoproliferative Thrombocytopenia for additional details. Now let's move on to plasma and prothrombin complex concentrate. The latter is also known as PCC. In coagulopathy and transfusion, it is important to always consider the following. Is my patient truly clinically coagulopathic, or do they just have an abnormal lab result? What is the etiology of the coagulopathy? Remember to draw all necessary tests before treatment. And finally, why do I need to reverse the coagulopathy in the first place? If I'm reversing pre-procedure, what is the most appropriate timing? And if secondary to anticoagulation, what are the risks of reversal, and when should anticoagulation be restarted? This diagram from WH Zeek in Transfusion Therapy, Clinical Principles and Practice from the ABB Press shows that if the INR is less than or equal to 1.7, then there is at least 30% of coagulation factors present. This means a mildly elevated INR above the normal reference range may still be within the zone of normal, safe hemostasis. Remember that to issue frozen plasma, the Transfusion Medicine Service needs 30 minutes to complete the type and screen first, and then at least 15 minutes to thaw the plasma before issue. And finally, plasma transfusion also needs time to infuse into the patient. Keep in mind the INR of frozen plasma is also not normal, ranging anywhere from 1.2 to about 1.6 or higher in some cases. You may refer to the Alberta Health Services Edmonton Zone Consensus Guidelines for Management of Abnormal Coagulation INR in Bedside Imaging Guided Procedures here, and the Frozen Plasma Request Form is also available on the AHS website. Now let's talk about prothrombin complex concentrate and warfarin reversal. In Canada, PCC is available under the trade names of Octoplex and Beriplex. In the United States, it is known as K-Centra. PCC is used for emergency reversal of warfarin anticoagulation in the setting of life-threatening or severe bleeding or urgent procedure or surgery required within six hours. PCC contains heparin, and hence the absolute contraindication is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT. Repeat the INR 15 to 30 minutes after the PCC infusion to confirm reversal. The maximum total dose is 120 cc's or 3,000 international units. This slide summarizes the adult dosing regimen for PCC. If the INR is between 1.5 to 2.9, then request 40 cc's or 1,000 international units to reverse warfarin. If the INR is between 3 to 5, then the appropriate dose is 80 cc's or 2,000 international units. And finally, if the INR is greater than 5, then issue 120 cc's or 3,000 international units. If the INR is unknown and major bleeding is present on warfarin, then 80 cc's should be administered. You may find the PCC request form on the Alberta Health Services website under the Edmonton Zone section. This slide summarizes the Choosing Wisely Canada guidelines from CSTM on plasma and PCC. Their third recommendation is that we do not transfuse plasma to correct a mildly elevated INR or activated PTT test before a procedure. Their fifth recommendation is that we do not routinely use plasma or PCC for non-emergency reversal of vitamin K antagonists. 
Last but not least, here are the general clinical indications for IVIG. There are two main dosing regimens. The immunosuppression dose is 1 to 2 grams per kilogram, and this is the dose most commonly used for ITP and Guillain-Barre syndrome, for example, while the immunodeficiency dose is 0.4 grams per kilogram every 3 to 4 weeks. The maximum dose for any clinical indication is accepted at 2 grams per kilogram. Please refer to the published IVIG utilization guidelines for the exact clinical indications and their specific dosing regimens. In summary, we should consider the patient's blood counts and clinical context when requesting a transfusion. We should consider non-transfusion alternatives such as hematinics and observation in the appropriate clinical context. We should not transfuse plasma to correct a mildly elevated INR or PTT in a non-bleeding patient or before a procedure. We should not use plasma or PCC for non-emergent reversal of vitamin K antagonists. And finally, we should refer to published IVIG utilization guidelines for the appropriate clinical indications and their dosing regimens. This concludes Practical Transfusion Medicine Part 2 on blood product utilization and clinical indications. In Part 3, in a separate recording, we will go through informed consent and transfusion adverse events. Thank you very much for your attention.